Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I've been excited about this one for a while. Today we have Steve Dorman, who's one of the legends of direct response marketing on television. Steve wrote and directed and produced six successful infomercials that grossed over $300 million. He created Curiosity Perfume and New Glow Cosmetics, which were the most successful fragrances ever sold on television. He is the author of $12 billion of inside marketing secrets discovered through Direct TV. I don't know if you can see that there. I got it right here. And currently, he runs a company from the lab and Inside Beautiful that curates beauty products to appear in retail. Steve, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. A pleasure, Jeremy. There are so many questions I have, uh, and I, I have to ask this one to start. What's the most successful infomercial? And if you could talk about some from start to finish, from discovery of the product to sale on TV and some of the key components with it. Uh, what's the most successful uh, uh, campaign of all time? No, the year that you uh, were a part of. Oh, that I was a part of. Okay. Well, see, I, I used to publish a subscription newsletter called the Infomercial Marketing Report for 12 years. So we were kind of the unbiased uh, gossip uh, uh, monger. Well, in give the me industry. both then. Give me the unbiased gossip. Well, there, there's a few. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the biggest two of all time, I think at this point, is uh, proactive that Guthy Ranker does for the acne medication. It's the number one acne medication in the United States. Right. And they do close to about $850 million a year in that. And uh, the other one that was very successful that I was kind of instrumental in um, uh, getting done was uh, the Total Gym with uh, Chuck Norris and Christy Brinkley. Um, that one has done probably just under uh, $2 billion over the last 10 years. It's amazing. So um, the most successful ones, I did a series of infomercials with uh, Boardroom, uh, Brian Kurtz and Bottom Line Health and the whole crew over there, Rita Shankowitz. Um, and it was uh, the first infomercial we did with Hugh Downs and uh, was selling a health book. And nobody thought at that point, because uh, the industry was very, very tough um, in the mid-2000s, that uh, you could sell a thirty nine ninety five book on television with no back end. No back and end. No back end. They had no back end. And... Uh, we did a really, really good job doing it. So um, that's that was on the air for over three years. Wow. So what were some of the lessons, big lessons learned in that? Well, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll go back to uh, something that I learned when I had done my first infomercial, which uh, was for Curiosity Perfume. Mm -hmm. And that was... Uh, something that nobody thought that you could do on television was uh, perfume because women have to smell it in right. order to buy right. it. Yeah. So um, I was publishing this unbiased newsletter in the industry and didn't want to appear to be competing with any of my readers who were paying $400 a year for this information. Right. Um, but I had a way of, uh, of making this work, of selling it on television. So um, I discovered a whole lot of things by doing something and keeping my eyes open to all possibilities, not making any assumptions. And I think that's a really important thing to have a, kind of a childlike viewpoint on everything mm -hmm. uh, because it stops you from making mistakes or, or repeating other people's assumptions. And um, the... One of the big lessons that I learned in that, which uh, I think I've only discussed one other place, is that in uh, infomercials, which run, a regular infomercial runs traditionally about 28 minutes, 30 seconds. Normally, if you look at all infomercials, there was a rule of thumb that somebody came up with in the industry, and I'm not sure who, where they figured that people back then would only watch an average of about seven minutes of television before they turned the dial. 
So they created a series of th four pods within the uh, commercial hmm. where you would have the salesmanship and then the ordering information four times. And um, I didn't believe in that for some reason. Um, and I'm not quite sure why. But what, so what I did was I built the infomercial. Uh, we had a model in Los Angeles, Minneapolis, and New York, put the fragrance on, go out into the streets. In New York, it was great. It was the opening of the opera uh, at Lincoln Center. It was Wall Street at lunchtime, and those guys were animals. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, Fifth Avenue. Um, and these beautiful models would go up strangers and say, will you smell me? And we just follow them along and got the reactions to this fragrance, wow, yeah. which was incredible. What made By you think way, of doing that? Well, I, I figured the only way you could sell the perfume is by really inciting a person's curiosity. And we were lucky enough to get the name Curiosity. Yeah, it's a great name. How'd Thank you, you. What made you decide there? How'd you come up with it? Uh, well, the name actually uh, was uh, a brainstorming session I had with Joe Sugarman. Okay. Tell and I told it, yeah. Joe what I was doing, and he said, well, you're trying to incite curiosity. That's a great name. And by some bizarre chance, uh, it was available. So I registered it with the trademark office. Wow. Um, so What uh, was first on the chopping block? What were the other, were there any other like contenders with that? Or was it just curiosity and you're like, that's it? Well, that was the one that was really magical. But no, I mean, anytime you go to trademark a name nowadays, and and this was, the perfume was in 1993. So, you know, 21 years ago already. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm still getting emails. I haven't produced the, the perfume in almost, what, 17 years. I'm still getting emails almost every couple months from a woman saying, this is my favorite fragrance of my entire life. I've just run out. Where can I get some more? So can people still get it? No. They can't. They can't get it anymore. But it just goes to show you, as successful as the perfume um, campaign was, perfume was the wrong thing to do on TV because it has a shelf life of 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah. For, you know, it just sits gotcha. there on the counter and looks nice for a really long period of time. Right, yes. So um, anyway, uh, so we... Uh, you so followed the models around. We followed the models around. So the way that the commercial was constructed was um, we had Los Angeles first, we had Century City, we had Sunset Strip, and uh, and then we went to Minneapolis and had this beautiful farm-looking girl walking around the lake and uh, people rollerblading by. I mean, uh, Min Minneapolis in the spring or the fall looks like uh, how heaven would be depicted in a Twilight Zone episode. I mean, it's just like the most beautiful play. You don't want to be there in the winter. No. But spring and fall, they have a bandstand there on the lake and people are rollerblading by and the beautiful people. And it's just amazing. It really is like a heaven on earth. And then we had New York. So we had the first commercial 15 minutes in after the Minneapolis scene. Then we had a, a, a thing with a, uh, a lab uh, segment, why the fragrance is so special, why it's so different. And then we had New York, which was incredible. So uh, it was, um, we aired it on a certain amount of stations for a test on the weekend. And I showed it to a group of six women individually. All the women turned around and said the same thing to me. They said, privately, they said to me, I love this, but you made me wait too long to order. Hmm. I was ready to order in the first seven minutes. Wow. And I honestly would have turned it off if I had to wait that long. So I went, whoa, I might have produced the most successful infomercial of all time. They don't even want to wait until the end, let alone 15 minutes. They're ready to order in the first three to four minutes. So I went back, I recut the show, and I put the first commercial seven minutes in. Okay? Aired it on the same stations and the same time slots, as close as I could get it. And guess what happened? What happened? Any guesses? What happened after you aired it? Yeah. What What happened? What was the 
how different was the result from airing exactly the same show except the commercial was up closer uh, from the week before? Well, I'm going to guess you doubled sales. Right. Based on the focus group, that's what you would guess, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. The result was the opposite. The results failed by 50%. Really? We had 50% of the orders. So um, when you go back and you take a look at that, you're dealing with two very important elements when you're selling something. You're dealing with the intellect and you're dealing with the emotions. Okay? People have to intellectually be able to justify their sale, even though they're excited about it. They weren't seven minutes in. They were emotionally excited about it, but they really weren't ready to order. They needed to see more. So um, what I discovered, as soon as you give your ordering information out, which is what everybody else is doing by doing the seven-minute pods, right. there's no reason for a person to keep watching. They already know what the payoff is. And being that they're not charged and ready to order at that point, there's no reason for him to keep watching. Mm -hmm. So everybody else that is airing these infomercials by pods ha are potentially cutting their response rate by 50%. Wow. So that was a huge lesson for me. That's a huge lesson. And, and when they said that to you, it almost did it justify in your mind that, oh, maybe those pods are correct and, that, and you put it back in. No, it, did, it didn't just... Uh, I mean, you thought... Oh, when I, I didn't it. know. I didn't know. Yeah. And that's why I think it's so important to maintain the I don't know. I mean, the longer yeah. I've been doing this, the more yeah. I realize I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the key points. You have a great section in the back of this book, your, your note, your section, your special report, your personal formula. And one of the first bullets I remember is you don't know if it's going to be successful or not. That's a scary you know. thing, especially coming from you. Well, it's true. I mean, I, uh, you know, when I, when I was working with boardroom and everything, they always could see that uh, at certain times I'd creatively get really stimulated and all of a sudden the brain would start churning and I'd come up with a way of doing something very, very unique. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you take a look at our, uh, the infomercials I did with, for boardroom, there is basically one call to action. It's at the very end of the show. So that makes what we were doing much more difficult than what anybody else was doing because they were basically doing a seven-minute pod and repeating it four times. Mm -hmm. We had to structure a show. Well, let, let me back up and, and tell you um, my analysis of how difficult a successful infomercial is. Okay? Yeah, yes, please. Um, in every, um, every year, and of course, this was much more prevalent when there were just – four primary networks or three primary networks years ago. And every year, these people would uh, fund 20 to 30 pilot scripts. Of the 20 to 30 pilot scripts, maybe they would make 10 pilots and a lot of money. They would put these shows on the air. Of, of those, maybe four shows would get on the air. Of the four shows, they'd be in the TV guide. They'd be on the same time every week. They'd have major stars on with a lot of publicity. And all they were hoping for is that you would just tune in and watch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that season, they were lucky if any of those shows were left. With an infomercial, they're on the weirdest times of day and night you can imagine. For sure. Yeah. You have no idea that you're going to find them. You have to find it by accident. So once you happen upon it, you have to be so captivated by what you're seeing that you're enthralled and you stay tuned. And at the end of what you're watching, be so excited that you literally jump out of the chair, pick up the phone, and give the producers money. Now, that's kind of a miracle. It sounds like a miracle, yeah. Yeah. So, And the same is true with a, direct, a, a really good direct marketing piece. I mean, people don't read, so you have to captivate them and get them so excited by what they're reading. Yeah. And you'll, you notice, by the way, in most direct marketing pieces, they don't pay off what the offer is until the end. Right, so, yeah. So there is a similarity there. For sure. But create that 30-minute context of a show, which uh, you're walking a really fine balance there between entertainment and salesmanship. Yeah. If you're too entertaining, they won't take you seriously for your sales. And if you're too sales oriented, 
they're going to get browbeaten and not to uh, stay around either. Mm -hmm. So you're really, really walking a tightrope, really walking a tightrope. So it's very, very difficult to do uh, like, you know, any really good salesmanship. So what, what worked, what else worked with the curiosity infomercial and what did you find didn't work? Well, I change. um, Again, being an outsider, that was my first real venture into the beauty world. Being an outsider, I think, helped. Uh, the story behind that is I, I think that uh, it cost as much money to produce a marketing campaign for a lousy product as it does a great product. Right. So you better put your time and your money and effort into making sure that that product is great and giving yourself every chance possible. So knowing how I was going to sell this, I had that vision of how I was going to sell it. I um, I went to one of the top fragrance houses in the world who had three of the top fragrances of the top ten at that time, um, Giorgio being one of them, which was huge, huge fragrance. And I said, guys, I don't know what this smells like, but it's got to do two things for this to work. Number one, women have to fall in love with it the very first time they smell it or we're going to get flooded with returns. Right. Second thing is, guys have to find it incredibly sexy to the point where they react when they smell it. Mm -hmm. So their whole staff, their top scientists and marketing people said to me, well, nobody's ever asked us to do this before. Really? And I, yeah. And I said, I would think everybody be asking you to do this. I said, no, that's not how the fragrance industry works. Weird. What do people ask them? They said, everything is monkey see monkey do they decide that they're going to launch a fragrance they're going to get a Liz Taylor they're going to get a major star we're going to do a marketing campaign so give me another Giorgio but make it a little more floral make it a little more musky everything will be predicated on a fragrance that is already popular with a little tweaking interesting that's the safe way to go yeah yeah um, and um, do so they, they think you were crazy or smart at the time I don't know if it was a question of that. I think they were basically saying, I don't know if we can do this. Mm. So it took a year and a half to develop the fragrance, and they made 653 different formulas until we found the one that worked. Holy cow. Yeah. So um, it was – so finally we did. Finally we found it, and the fragrance really did work. I mean, these women put it on – Women loved it when they smelled it, but guys, I mean, we got all sorts of candid, nothing staged reactions. Guys were going back for two or three smells. It's really incredible. So um, so that was a lot of lessons for a lot of reasons, and both designing the product and taking yeah. the time to design the product, yeah. as well as the uh, marketing lessons that were learned. Yeah. So now you have the product. What? Now I- Product. Yeah, th- I mean that's a huge undertaking. Now, what what do you do next? Well, then then you know we went around and we uh, we shot the uh, shot the infomercial, mm-hmm. and that was you know, and I was funding all this out of my own pocket, oh. and um, it was and and I have a tendency not to do things very easy. Um, so I mean, when you stop to think about it, we had a small crew, but we were shooting in. L.A., Minneapolis, and New York, opening of the Opera Lincoln Center, had to get permits for everything, three models, makeup on the streets of New York. Um, So it wasn't easy, but it was fun. That's a huge undertaking. Yeah. Yeah. So is this just you? And all of it is, you know, unlike copy, where you're basically just paying, you know, a copywriter a fee, and, um, you know, and it's a fair amount depending on who the copywriter is. I mean, this is almost like a mini feature film that you're making because mm-hmm. you're, you've got the writing, you've got the product creation, you've got the production, and then you've got the media test before you ever know what you've got, mm-hmm. if you've got anything. So, very uh, risky. It's very risky. It's very rich. It's very much like the feature film business, which is a, if you hit it big, it's fantastic. And if you don't, 
you're out all the money up front. There, you have no saving grace. So why did you choose perfume? Well, I, I chose perfume because, uh, number one, I thought I had a unique way of selling it. Um, I thought it would be um, very entertaining and people would want to watch it. Um, and uh, it wasn't competing with any of my readers, which was my bread and butter business. I see. None of them, none of them would ever <laughs> think of doing that. So what were some of the people, when you produced the, the newsletter, what were some of the interesting cases you were presenting uh, from the industry? <clears throat> well, you know, it was very interesting because even though I had some journalism school in, uh, um, well, actually, since you're dealing with a lot of entrepreneurs, let me, let me tell you the whole story about the newsletter. Yeah, go ahead. Because that's, that's kind of interesting, and yeah. I know you probably have a lot of information-based people out there. So I, going back, I had kind of a dual background. I was always really interested in the entertainment business, and that's, uh, that's really what I wanted to do. And I graduated from UCLA Film School, and when I got out of school, I ended up writing some episodes of Happy Days and some other things. Yeah, I was reading about that, yes. Yeah. So, um, but I always was interested in entrepreneurship and I think the main kind of thread of my life is kind of creating coming up with an idea in my head and then bringing it out into the world that's where I get my thrill I don't get a thrill with the day-to-day -day operations you need day-to-day -day operations and you have to be really good at day-to-day -day operations but that's not that's not where I think my talent is even though I've got a lot of street smarts and I've learned a lot of lessons there as well so um, there isn't that big of a jump between entrepreneurship and the entertainment business because you're conceiving something and then bringing it out to the world right. one way or the other. So um, in, uh, I came up with the very first idea for uh, the first home video dating service okay. called Videomate. The love of your life could be on your TV tonight. It's a good okay? saying. Yeah, it's catchy. Right. So this is in the 80s. So this is before computers were widespread, certainly before internet. So I produced two videotapes. One had 50 men, the other one 50 women. Uh, both of them localized to Los Angeles, but everything from a 19-year-old student to the uh, Long Beach Civic Light Opera uh, president. Um, and the tapes were for sale. I went out and made deals with the, uh, all the major book chains, the tower videos back then, which were really big, yeah. warehouse, uh, that they would only sell these tapes for 1995. It was before 900 numbers. So we had a card in there that if you saw any of the women that you were, or men that you were interested in, you'd write a letter, send it to our office, and we'd uh, forward it to them. I love this. Yes. Yeah. And we had, like, in a matter of three months, we had three engagements happen. We wow. got on entertainment tonight. Uh, the tapes were like all over the place. It was kind of amazing. Um, but then my financing fell through. The bank officer who was lending me half of the money for it left, and the bank decided that it was too risky of a venture oh, wow. to roll it out. So I spent a year trying to find money, and, um, and I think that's the worst thing in the world is trying to find money um, unless you, you know, you're an ex-executive with Google. Um, so, um, anyway, but then I came up with the idea of doing it as an infomercial because they were just starting to come into prominence and ended up putting a deal together with a group of people, a high powered lawyer, an agent, and, um, they decided they wanted to do it their own way and do a dating infomercial. So they bought me out and they put a infomercial on the air that was not successful, but I learned a lot about the industry. So a friend of mine was a West Coast regional sales manager of Apple Computer. He left there to go with their largest value-added reseller, and uh, which was selling Apple Computer equipment through an infomercial along with software so you could do your own home-based business. Hmm. So I consulted with them on everything because I had the direct marketing background. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, after two years, they decided to get out of the infomercial business. So I found myself in the role of being a consultant, and I knew nothing about consulting. How do you find a client? You know, what do you charge? So I did some searching, and I found that there was one guy who was known as the consultant's consultant. And he had an audio course on consulting. So I bought it. Who was it? You know, I forgot his name. He was out here in Woodland Hills, California. Um, and so it was a set of cassettes and workbooks. Well, I looked at there. I looked through it. One of the very first things it said, and he was dealing mostly with real estate agents, how you become like a consultant uh, in the real estate business. And it said, well, you have to establish yourself in an, as an industry leader. And he said, one way you can do this is by starting a newsletter and giving your opinion and everything on it. So I started thinking, well, this, there's this whole new world of infomercials. These people in the infomercial business don't come from direct marketing. They're like entrepreneurs looking for the gold rush. Mm -hmm. So they know nothing about direct marketing. So these people need information. So I took my last $3,000 and my Macintosh computer and my laser printer, which was $5,000 back then, on my kitchen table. And I spent three months putting together a first issue of the newsletter and a sales letter. And there was a brand new trade organization that was forming. And um, I sent it out to uh, uh, the 150 people that had attended the first trade show uh, meeting. And within two weeks, all of a sudden, $35,000 came back. Wow. And I went, wow, there might be a business. What, what was your sales letter? Tell me about your sales letter. <laughs> well, I did something kind of ingenious, if I do say so myself, <laughs> because everybody in this business wanted information and there was no information available. I mean, at that point, there were no public companies. Nobody revealed what their sales figures and everything were. However, but what I found was that some of the most successful companies that had been on the air for a couple of years started selling their mailing lists. Hmm. So all of us, so I did an analysis of what list they were selling, what products they were, and then it was very easy to put the data together when they were showing how many new users per month, what the product cost, what their sales were. Mm -hmm. So the whole sales letter teased that about revealing what their sales figures were. Well, everybody got a little crazy. How would he know what my sales? Well, it's based on their own numbers. As long as they're giving accurate information, these numbers were correct. So, um, so literally we went from, from that and within about a year and a half, we were being read in 50 countries. Mm. We were being quoted by Wall Street Journal, New York Times, uh, Time Magazine, we're interviewed by like 5,000 news sources. Um, we formed a relationship with Ad Week, Brand Week, and Media Week, and actually created a supplement for those publications that was our most requested supplement. And um, then we started doing conferences, and we were the first West Coast conference. It's on infomercials. We gave the first awards out in the infomercial industry, and Penn and Teller did our first award show. Oh, wow. So, um, it was really interesting. And then uh, I started a conference called a Sell Your Product on Television Treasure Hunt, where we took full page ads out in USA Today saying, do you as an individual or a company have a product that you think would work on TV? Does it meet this criteria? Um, we listed the criteria, what the price points had to be, the kind of needs it had to fill, markup involved and everything. Mm -hmm. And we could take only 50 companies. And what we would do is we charge these companies, I think it was around $1,700. Uh, in the morning, we had a conference where the lawyers of the industry would talk about how the deals would take place. They'd be educated on how the industry worked. In the afternoon, we pre-set up half-hour one-on-one meetings with in suites with all the major companies individually in the industry. So a person could go in and in two days pitch their product. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it created a real buzz because they know if they see something that interests, you're going down the hall a half hour later to their competitor. Right, right. So, so that's where the Total Gym was discovered. Wow. At that conference, along with the Topsy Tail and several other big products. 
Um, so um, uh, we really help the entrepreneur a lot. Um, that's and huge. It's a, yeah, it's like early it's day Shark Tank almost. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, so um, anyway, but that's that's kind of how I got into that business of being the unbiased news source, but being entrepreneurial in the same way. And we closed the newsletter and everything down in 2012 because the industry had just consolidated so much. Um, to give people an idea, Steve, at that time when you were doing this, what were some of the infomercials that were on air in oh, those days? Well, you had, um, you know, the, the, the two biggest prevalent infomercials that uh, really kind of started the whole trend. There were earlier ones, but uh, Tony Robbins in 1989, yeah. um, who had a senator on the air, I mean, incredible production value, and Victoria Jackson Cosmetics, who had Allie McGraw and Lisa Hartman on her show. And nobody had ever seen that before, and it was such a different time. You know, you look back and, and time just marches forward, but, you know, in those times when those commercials aired, because there were only three major networks and people only had seven to eight channels on their dial, right, right. that when one of these things hit the air for the first time, the next day at work, everybody was standing around talking about it. Did you see that thing with that giant guy talking and the senator and all those? And, and did you see Ali, uh, Ali McGraw talking about makeup? Everybody was talking about it. And that's the biggest problem now with marketing is that you can't hit a mass market like you used to. It used to be so easy. Mm -hmm. People didn't know how good they had it. Um, and that's why, you know, the movie business has had such an issue lately is that even a, a $10 million film costs as much money to market as a $100 million film to reach the number of eyeballs. It's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Nobody solved that problem yet. So um, anyway, so those were the two prominent ones. You had the Juice Man. The Juice Man, this was, this was the most unbelievable thing. They started out just airing their infomercial to get people to go to a seminar locally. So like it aired, it blanketed for the entire weekend in Los Angeles. Come to the free seminar, come to the free seminar. And you would go to the seminar at a hotel ballroom. There would be lines around the block to get mm -hmm. in there. And they were selling a $300 juicer back then. And they were making so much money, it was unbelievable. And then later, they started actually selling the juicer on television directly. But that had the most amazing effect because juicers, no matter what brand, were then flying off the shelves. And these juicers had been sitting on store shelves for years. Mm. But all of a sudden, it created a buzz unlike the stores hadn't seen before. And I had interviewed in the newsletter the chairman of Bloomingdale's at that time. And when he left there after 35 years, he got into the direct television business because he said, I've never seen product move off shelves like with a successful infomercial. So it was quite an interesting time back then. Why did they um, not sell it directly instead of selling it, go, telling him to go to a free seminar? Um. I think back then, I think it was a couple of issues. I think number one is they had some manufacturing issues so that they could only produce so much at a, a time. They also thought because it was so expensive that they needed Jay um, to talk one-on-one -on -one and get people excited in that environment. Mm -hmm. And also it was a very expensive price point. Nobody had ever gotten people to part with $300 at one fell swoop. Right. The Tony Robbins was expensive that uh, I think think he hit the air at around 180, 189. And that was expensive. But a $300, $350 juicer plus the upsells and everything, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money mm -hmm. on television. So what are some of your favorite infomercials of all time? Um, well, let's see. There was um, uh well, one of them I got uh, one of them I got a kick out of was um, there was a, a producer in uh, Salt Lake City named Eric Stolson who had a company Stolson and Stolson, and he did an infomercial for a product called the Health Rider, which was a big fitness phenomenon. 
But again, it was a really great mix of salesmanship with entertainment. Mm -hmm. And he brought in like 20 girls who choreographed entire dance numbers mm -hmm. that were incredible during the show. Um, the other one that was really one of the early times, and we interviewed them uh, in the book as well, is um, Soloflex. Soloflex was one of the early uh, fitness products. And... Um, it was beautifully shot on 35 millimeter film and you're going over every inch of these sweaty bodies and watching the muscles and it was just gorgeous. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that they ran those commercials 24 hours a day in several gay bars up in San Francisco. Wow. Um, that, that was kind of like amazing, those shows. And then, um, you know, fitness was a trend, beauty was a trend. Uh, there were some huge failures, too, that were really interesting. You had a company like Revlon um, who saw the kind of money everybody was making and decided that they were going to get into the infomercial business, and they paid a fortune to Dolly Parton for her to endorse a line of color cosmetics. And they followed uh, Dolly on the road on the tour in her tour bus, talking about her color cosmetics and showing what life on the farm was like. Well. This was like the biggest failure Revlon ever had. Mm -hmm. I mean, they spent millions of dollars on this thing. But they never asked themselves the big question, which is how many women in the United States want to look like Dolly Parton? Apparently not a lot. <laughs> no. And, and what was interesting, because I, you know, I had so many inside connections when we were reporting on the industry. I mean, I, I heard from the uh, telemarketing bureau that was getting the calls that they were flooded with phone calls from people going, you know, I, I really love Dolly and I really want to get this. Could you hold it one for me until Tuesday where and I get my welfare check? Mm. Flooded with calls like that. So a different market. Totally different market. Yeah. So Steve, what else uh, from your career do you consider big milestones? Mm. Well, The um, um, when I uh, Ad Week, Brand Week, and Media Week purchased the uh, magazines from me, um, and I took that money and I could have bought my first house, and I thought, well, I'd be sitting in a house, but I'd be thinking of all the time, what if I did something else with that money? So I decided to pursue my dream, and I wrote, directed, and produced a feature film called Divorce the Musical. Mm -hmm. and I was again, listening to a little bit of it the other day. <laughs> oh, you're listening to On it? YouTube. You could find some clips on YouTube. Of Divorce the Musical? Yes. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. I never knew that. Yep. It's By it's the It's the way, same one. Yeah. <clears throat> really? Not your... Are you thinking about the stage play? I don't know. I, I, you know, when I saw it, that you produced it, I went on YouTube to see what was out there, and it was just like uh, one of the clips of the, a song from it. Because so, there was, uh, were they kids doing the song? You couldn't see. It was just like a, a sc like a screenshot, and then just a song. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. That might have been on the uh, on one of the lead the lead actress said. The song on her website, um, who went on to star in a Disney series and got very popular. Yes. Um, the um, um, well, this is exactly well. Okay, so let me set the stage for this one. Um, it was right after Blair Witch, so everybody stood up and took notice that you can actually have a low budget film make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, I came up with this idea for uh, doing a, a film about a couple going through a divorce and uh, the father's trying to get close to his actress daughter and um, she just wants to be an actress. And uh, in order to be close to her, he decides to produce a musical hmm. about divorce to give them something to start talking about. So it's exactly what they tell you not to do when you're doing your first film. Which is what? Uh, um, well, in your first film, if you look at most independent films that are self-funded, mm -hmm. 
they always take place in two or three rooms usually, or at least two or three locations, with a cast of four or five. And that's about it. This was a cast of 60, Whoa. including 20 kids ages 6 to 18 who sing and dance, eight original production numbers, special effects, 17 different locations. I mean, insane. <coughs> Is that where all your hair went? You just pulled it out after that or what happened? It's, um, well, the hair is another story. The hair is another story. What happened with the hair is it was getting a little thin on top. And I have a two-year-old son. And um, I wanted him to feel at home when he came out. <laughs> so, so my hair was getting a little thin. And I went, I'm going to just shave it. What uh, the hell? Looks good. Make him feel at home and comfortable. So uh, I shaved my head. And he came out with a full head of black hair. <laughs> and I've just kept it that way for the last two years. I like it. Thanks. <laughs> so you had this huge cast. Huge cast. Huge cast. And um, um, and I was really, it was the hardest thing I ever did. Hardest thing I ever did. Um, it took two years. Um I uh, I got a friend of mine who had edited two of Prince's feature films to be our editor. Isidore Mankowski was the uh, director of photography who had shot the Neil Diamond jazz singer in the famous film Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour. The uh, gaffer and his crew had done the Michael Keaton Batman movies. Um, you went so, all out for this. Yeah, we, we had just really really a great crew but I mean so many things happened the producer that I had staged a walkout like the second week and we had to bring everybody back and the lead why? actor why did you stage a walkout who knows <laughs> who knows <laughs> who knows uh, but the lead actress who played I acted in the film also and the lead actress played my daughter, who was 15 at the time, showed up for work on the on the second week with 104 fever. Oh, wow. Mom took her to the doctor, and she almost died. Jeez, that's dangerous, so, yeah. So, you know, at that point, the movie didn't mean anything. But what did she almost die of? Toxic shock syndrome at 15. Whoa. So, um, so we didn't know if we'd get the movie made or not. So there were a lot of – it was it was hard. But um, <clears throat> it played in L.A. for two weeks, um, got a full-page story in the front page of the L.A. Times, um, got some incredible reviews from Ain't It Cool News and uh, Children's Rights Foundation in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and had a couple distribution offers, but they were terrible distribution offers. So I elected not to go with any of them. So nobody's seen the film outside of uh, those two weeks in Los Angeles. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. Can you get it now or no? Can someone watch you order it or something? Nope. Why not? It's just not available. We haven't. Um, I'd like to get it on Apple TV, but you know, it's like anything else. It's like, you know, if you've looked on on Apple TV or if you look in iTunes, you get in the top chart of new releases for a week, right? And after that, unless somebody knew that you were there, they'd never find you. Mm -hmm. It's the a marketing problem. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, anyway. What but, are the big um, lessons you learned then from that, that experience? Would you go back and change that? Actually, no. I, I kind of consider that my PhD, and I actually learned more uh, on that, in that two-year period of time, both about myself and what my capabilities were, that I was able to then uh, utilize in the infomercials that I later did with, uh, with Boardroom. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I, I mean, I think it, it, it paid off in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but it really paid off by knowing what I could do and what I couldn't do. I mean, I ended up, uh, one of the infomercials that we did with boardroom that unfortunately, um, didn't roll out was, uh, I got to work with one of my, uh, heroes who was, uh, John Cleves. And we did an amazing infomercial that ended up going on and winning three telly awards. Mm. Um, but 
the problem was it was for boardrooms uh best-selling book of all time um the book of inside uh secrets what they don't want you to know about and um so it would tell you how to the best time to reserve hotels best way to get discounted you know hotel rates airlines retirement homes all of these things well, unfortunately, the infomercial came out in 2008 where the bottom dropped out of everything. Right. And um, nobody cared about any of that stuff. They were worried about paying their rent. Mm -hmm. So timing was wrong. But the show, the show is great. And to be able to work with John and have the confidence to direct him uh, was a great thing. So what made some of the, the boardroom that did air successful the on the, the health book what components because I know you said you have to have that entertainment factor and the sales factor right how that that infomercial work well um, it was you know we did one one commercial uh, at first where um, uh, it was uh, it was very low cost to shoot it and uh, it was successful. And then I wanted to up the game with the second one. And uh, we got Hugh Downs uh, to do the second one. Now, Hugh has never really endorsed anything before. And at that time, um, he was still incredibly well known uh, of people 40 plus from um, 2020. I mean, his career, I mean, his career spans you know, the history of television. He was uh, a host for the Today Show at one point. Um, and Jack Parr's uh, co-host on The Tonight Show. So, um, but, so to get an authority figure like Hugh to actually really legitimately question some of these health things. Yeah, yeah. Was... Um, Very credible. In my mind, I wanted to really ratchet up the credibility and the authority factor of mm. all of this. So that was number one. Number two was, you know, the board books are very high quality books. The content's incredible. Um, you know, my my wife who works for uh, Paramount Studios reads, you know, literally everything. And the first thing she can't wait to read when we get home, when she gets home, is if there's a uh, bottom line health newsletter. I get there. that, yeah. Yeah, it's it's fantastic stuff. Uh, and um, so they do a wonderful job with that. And um, they have all the credibility there. Um, I think it was kind of coming up with a way of enhancing that credibility as much as possible. So it was my idea to actually um, go around and uh, take, I worked with Arthur Johnson on the uh, script. And um, we picked some of the fascinations from the book that we wanted to highlight in the television show. Yeah. <laughs> and then I went all over the country with a uh, camera crew and um, um, we shot doctors to introduce their own articles. Now, nobody thought that they would do that. None of them were paid. But it was they had a vested interest because that was their information and it was important to them. Mm -hmm. They've devoted their life to it. So, um, so again, you know, when, when I made the comment about putting the time in to develop your product, <coughs> excuse me, these infomercials with Boardroom, to really do the quality job we did, took a long time. Yeah. Um, from reformulating the book with the fascinations we want to use, yeah. maybe coming up with some other categories that we thought were lacking for the particular book and TV. So that took a long time. Uh, and then actually going around the country and shooting all these doctors, I mean, I, I'd be on the road sometimes for six weeks at a time. Um, and that was incredible. I mean, that was an incredible personal experience to meet some of these doctors. I mean, we had two Nobel Prize winners I got to meet, and hearing their stories, yeah. uh, you know, off camera was amazing. Um, so um, I think that's one of the reasons that these were so so successful was the authority figure. Mm -hmm. Do you remember some of the fascinations that worked so well? Uh, you know, I, I I don't remember. I don't remember the, some of the specific ones, but I mean, the categories are 
the same categories that you see hit over and over again. I mean, diabetes, arthritis, um, you know, longevity, memory, Alzheimer's, um, you know, same, same concerns that you see over and over again, mm -hmm. but with different tax, with different, um, uh, you know, analytics and everything. And of course we had, uh, two FTC attorneys that vetted everything. Mm, wow. So, um, because I, you know, I, I've seen a lot of stuff out there that, um, um, you know, television, unlike print, when you're doing your direct mailing, you're not quite as visible to the government uh, as you are when you're on television. Right, right. Very visible, and yeah. You're very, very visible on TV. So, um, you know, we really believed in not overstating anything, but saying it in the most creative way possible. Mm -hmm. Steve, since it's inspired Insider... Could you tell me what's been, you've had a, a great career and continues to be, what's been the lowest moment and how you push through those, those tough times? Wow. Oh, no, I'm depressed. Um, I think I think that I think that's probably. Uh, that's probably such a pertinent question because um, I think that the older that you get, the more difficult it is to still see things in a childlike way and have, maintain your curiosity and your childlike enthusiasm for trying new things. Mm -hmm. um, and when you are innovative you never know what's going to work and what isn't going to work. And so, um, so picking yourself up again and starting new and starting fresh when something doesn't work financially, mm -hmm. uh, I think is probably one of the most difficult things. And I've had that happen to me a number of times. <clears throat> I think, you know, if I was, if I was looking at the world through uh, 20 something eyes, when you're about to enter college or when you're in college, I think your fantasy is that you basically, at least it used to be, I don't know, I don't know for kids now, but um, it used to be that life was pretty much a straight line. You know, you graduate college, you'd find a career, you know, maybe you change jobs, but you'd stay kind of pretty much where you are. Mm -hmm. And in, in my life, that hasn't been the case at all. I mean, it's like things that I had no idea were going to play a part in my life um, ended up playing a part later in ways that I had no idea that it would. Like what? Uh, um, I think that... Um, well, lots of things. I mean, I'd always, uh, uh, one of my big hobbies and has been kind of a lifelong hobby has been photography. I was interested in photography from the time I was 11 or 12. And um, I actually did some, some test shootings for Playboy and other things when I was like 18 years old and did, decided I didn't want to pursue it as a career. But the things that I learned just from working with people and shooting people and seeing how well they looked, you know, really played a part in this. I mean, the other thing, just from a technical point of view, that I did in the boardroom infomercials that nobody would ever dare attempt unless they really knew what they were doing is I got the doctors who were all non professional performers to talk directly to camera. Yeah, yeah. That's Everybody tough. Shoots them from over here like they're doing a news report. Mm. But I just saw the power and the intimacy of. A doctor talking to a patient one on one. You're taking it remotely right. from over here. So little things like that that most people wouldn't dare to do. Um, I was able to do really, really successfully mm -hmm. and get performances out of them. I mean, some easier than others, but I think that that made a difference. Um, and I think that. Um, you know, I, and I think that there's a real duality 
with a lot of the marketers that I uh, have, you know, encountered is that everybody is kind of looking for the formula, the formula of what's going to work. You want the blueprint, yeah, yeah. And, and it, I saw the same thing in the infomercial business with the, the pod situation that we talked about. Right. Everybody followed the same formula. Um, and that's such a, a powerful thing uh, that you have to be aware of. I mean, even when we had these incredibly successful shows with Boardroom, they were saying couple people at boardroom were saying, well, what if, what if we did what everybody else was doing and put the commercials back, you know, in there that it's working for everybody else. But I knew where that led. And the only way I knew is by trying it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so I think that, um, um, you know, I was reading about a, a very well-known British photographer whose work I just came upon, uh, a week ago and I was reading some of his quotes and he was saying, you know, as soon as you have developed a technique and you've mastered the technique, you could spend the rest of your career doing exactly the same thing, but you're never going to grow. Mm -hmm. It just becomes mechanical. So it depends what's important to you in life. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you don't want to take chances and you just want to repeat yourself, you know, a different product, same mm -hmm. formula, you can do that, but yeah. uh, I uh, unfortunately I've never taken that easy road. You know, you mentioned a key point, which is losing that childlike way. Mm -hmm. What was the time you felt you lost a little bit of that? Um, because most people, I like how you phrase it. Most people wouldn't phrase it like that, and I kind of that's interesting. Well, I think that. Um, I think that you have there's a tendency when one is successful to want to hang on to what you know works. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of guts to try and break that to try and reach the next level, the next plateau. Right. So I I think that there's two times in one's life. One of it is when you're very successful, mm -hmm. something starts not working like it should or was, and then you want to recreate exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's way number one. So what, what way, time was that for you? <clears throat> um, oh, I think there's a propensity for doing it. I think there was a little bit of a propensity or a, a pull to do that with boardroom where we had five successful infomercials out of the gate mm -hmm. and you just kind of want to repeat it. Right. Right. So, um, um, so I always tried to stretch. I was always very aware of that. And sometimes it paid off and sometimes it didn't. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you make the third show better than the second show? Right. In that case, we did a, a live show from Arizona state university, helicopter shots, live studio audience. I mean, had a Nobel Prize winner in the audience. I mean, how do you keep pushing it? Uh, and then there's um, uh, and then th there's when you've just failed, whether it be with your all your own money and things are looking pretty gray. How do you pick yourself up right, yeah. and have the courage to start all over again yeah. and not repeat what you did before, which is what you all know? And and they're both very very difficult. It both tastes a lot of yeah. going inside rather than and getting out of your head. So what did you do at that time? What was one of those moments you wanted to need to pull yourself up? Um oh, I think that um I think that with um I think I mean I, I there were there were a number of things where Boy, I mean, uh, there was the uh, not getting financing for the home video dating. Um, the skincare company I did, New Glow, um, it wasn't taking off and we didn't have the financial resources to make it take off. So 
um, I, uh, I sold it to my partner and then I was starting all over again. In that case, that was kind of interesting because that's was right after I let go of that, that uh, things with the boardroom started cementing. So mm. that was a case of, you know, a door closes, one or two open. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, I think, I think the courageous thing is you have to really be ready to let go of something in order for that window to open. Mm-hmm. If you're still hanging on, how do you mentally do that though? Because at the time, now you could say that, but at the time it was probably really difficult. You go it's through very, this, you know, this you it's your baby almost, yeah. and you're like, what do I do next? How did you pull yourself mentally out of that that state? I guess I I think that um, I mean, in my personal case, I did a lot of self hypnosis work. Hmm. Um. I did a lot of um, self-hypnosis work of just going inside because the, the, the chatter in the head will kill you. Yeah. Chatter in the head will kill you. <laughs> so um, I uh, uh, did a lot of, lot of inner work, a lot of just letting go, a lot of long walks, um, and a curiosity, following the curiosity. I mean... That's the thing. You have to be able to let the conscious mind go and pay attention to what's gaining your focus because that's, you know, the thing with boardroom, for example, was, was kind of interesting. They, uh, they were interested in getting in the infomercial world because they saw Kevin Trudeau had a book on the air. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Brian Kurtz was talking to a couple of companies about maybe doing it with them. And Brian was a subscriber to my newsletter. That's what the connection was there. And, um, and Brian kept calling me up for advice. And he sent me over the contract of what one of these things could do. And I started mulling it over and thinking about it. And I said, well, show me what you want to do and everything. And I mean, he was asking me just for my opinion. It was just uh, from a friend to a friend. Right, right. And I said, you know, we could do this together. And um, we started outlining the parameters of that. Mm-hmm. And it took a couple months. But I that came out of nowhere. But it, yeah. it only came out because there was an openness to seeing that possibility. Right. And if I hadn't let go of the other one, that wouldn't have been there. Mm-hmm. So, Steve, what's been the proudest moment? This interview. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I got this on air. It's recorded. <laughs> uh, the proudest moment was, um, I boy, I've had a few of them. Yeah. I think the proudest moment was finishing the film and actually seeing it play in Los Angeles. The divorce. The divorce musical. musical. Yep. Um, I think that was one. Mm-hmm. Um, working with the people at Boardroom, and uh, meeting the doctors and the two Nobel Prize winners and working with John Cleese and Hugh Downs um, and really having affirmations from, I mean, Hugh Downs said I was the best director that he'd ever worked with, wow. which That's amazing. meets a lot. Yeah. Um, being able, and, and actually the thing I get so much joy out of is trying something a little bit different and not knowing if it's going to work and then seeing it come together. Mm-hmm. That's there's a lot of joy in that. Yeah. So, Steve, what what story like Jeremy? We need to include this story. If we miss out on this story, this is one of my favorite stories from my career. It would be a letdown if we didn't get to this. Oh well, I haven't lived that one yet. <laughs> that one's coming up. Uh, that one's coming up next. Yeah. So what's next? So tell me, where can people find you? What What are you working uh, on lately? Well, let's see. You have a couple companies. Yeah, I I have, um, well, I have a company called fromthelab.com that I started about two and a half years ago with a partner, Lorraine Dollinger, who's brilliant and talented. Um, And this was a whole other set of of how difficult can you make a startup. Tell Uh, me about it, yeah. (laughs) So... um, this is a this is an idea that I had. Well, let me go back. 
you you have time to hear it. I have as much time as you have. Yep. Uh -huh. uh, um, so I created a skincare line in uh, 2001 called New Glow, which is still around. Um, and it was a copper peptide technology that was uh, formulated by a, a medical cosmetic company up in Seattle. And they were just selling it to doctor's offices. And I got to them through the dermatology uh, chairman of uh, UC San Francisco who said, I've looked at these clinicals and this is the real deal. The wow. stuff really works. That's amazing, yeah. So, um, so I negotiated with them and licensed it for direct marketing purposes. Um, I got Nicola Sheridan as the spokesperson for it <coughs> right before uh, she signed on with Desperate Housewives, which is a whole other story. Um, I'll refrain from asking about it, but go on. <laughs> the, um, um, actually, let me, let me jump over to that. Go ahead, yeah. It's a really interesting story. Yeah. So Nicola Sheridan, if anybody knows, uh, women, women in your audience would know her probably more than the men. Mm -hmm. But um, Nicola Sheridan was a, basically in her late teens and early 20s on a show called Knots Landing. And um, when we first uh, had our agreement together, uh, I traveled with her. We got on QVC. Um, uh, women would come up to her in the street and just say, you were my role model growing up. Really? Because she was an aspiring 20-year-old girl on this television show who was working and trying to have a career. And these women just fawned all over her. Mm. So all of a sudden, she got in the middle of our arrangement this starring role on Desperate Housewives, a prime, you know, ABC show. And everybody said to me, oh, my God, for the amount of money that you got her for, and now you couldn't have ever afforded her now. You were so lucky. This is going to go through the roof and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody was patting each other on the back. So who does she play on Desperate Housewives? She's the neighborhood bitch. <laughs> So all of a sudden, all that goodwill that I saw when, you know, ew, no one wants to be like her anymore. Uh, 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 so that was, that was a real interesting lesson as far as, uh, choose your celebrities carefully, uh, choose your spokespeople carefully. So, um, back to the main story. The main story was six months after I licensed the product, from this company, um, Neutrogena came along, licensed the exact same product for retail under their name. Oh, wow. So again, I'm an outsider to this industry. This was an aha moment to me because it was a uh, first time that I saw that these major cosmetic companies don't necessarily develop their own products mm -hmm. or ingredients. Mm -hmm. And that was eye-opening. I yeah. thought all of them did. I thought everything was exclusive to them. And they had their own labs and were developing it. Well, they have their own labs, but not necessarily for that reason. Yeah. So I started investigating it. And the more I investigated it, the more I discovered that all of the major innovation in the cosmetic business was coming from these private beauty labs in Italy, Switzerland, and France who would spend five to seven years developing an ingredient or ing uh, a formula. And then they would have private closed door meetings with the majors, the SD Lauders, the L'Oreal's, the Procter and Gamble's, Johnson and Johnson's of the world and show them behind closed door what they had come up with. The majors would then take the products back to their headquarters. They'd vet them through sales and marketing, through packaging, and um, it would take them an average of three to four years, and that's not an exaggeration to bring a new product to market. And if they were first to launch it, it would cost them 20 to 30 million wow. to launch the marketing campaign. Amazing. So um, I saw a possibility. Everybody was doing continuity. The Guffy Rankers of the world and everything were doing continuity of right. you come up with one product, you get people to buy it month after month. And I went, well, but that's. But the other aha moment I had, my wife 
would sit there every month on the bed at night going through InStyle magazine, dog earing the pages of all the new products that were coming out. Hmm. So what I started seeing was that while there are certain products, once a woman finds a product that she's in love with, she's going to stick with it. They're always looking for the newest and the next thing. So I came up with this idea of founding this company from the lab where we took an entire year and formed these relationships with those European labs where they showed us the products and the ingredients the same time the major saw them in closed door meetings. We would then take them back to Beverly Hills. We'd have a focus group of about 20 to 30 women at the Peninsula Hotel. We'd let them uh, play with the products for 30 days, like 20 products uh, every quarter. And out of those 20 products, there'd be three or four that they went, oh my God, this is so different and better than what I'm using. I can't live without this. Hmm. We then place immediate limited lab runs with the labs. And every month, the women who sign up for the From the Lab Continuity Club get a full-size 30-day product of a product from the future up to an average of 18 to 24 months before it hits retail and 80% less than what it's going to cost in retail. Wow. So they never know what they're going to get. Hair care, skin care, or color cosmetics. The average retail mm -hmm. price of the product is 80 to $150. But when they sign up with us, it's $29.95 per month. Mm -hmm. So um, we got on the Today Show. We were featured as one of the best beauty sites uh, in InStyle Magazine. But we were self-funded. So now I'm in the place where we're out there looking for money to really blow this out of the water. So that's a hard thing, hard place to be because um, our return rate on our products is better than I've seen in our entire career. Women love these products so much. Uh, normally in direct response, your return rate's an average of about 15%. Our return rate is one-sixth of 1%. One wow, that's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. And our reorder rate, is incredible. Um, Can you our, fulfill even fulfill the reorder rate? Because if you have this limited quantity that you produce, we we order enough so that you know we have a, a idea of how much overage we need to do. Yeah. So yeah, I mean we don't want a woman to fall in love with the product and not be able to get it. Right. So yeah, we we make that happen. So we're in the middle now of, uh, we've run it now for about a year and a half. We've got all the stats. We know our lifetime value in 18 months is about $250 per woman. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so now it's just coming up with the right partner to blow this out. And that's what I'm in the middle of doing now. That's like, it goes back to the beginning, that finance, that funding. That's right. So where should we check it out? Because you have From a Lab and you have Inside Beautiful, right, too. Well, where? Inside Beautiful was a parent company, but FromTheLab.com is really the company. Is where people should go. Right. FromTheLab.com. If they want to read about the, uh, if they want to read about the direct marketing book, which is available on Amazon, mm -hmm. they can uh, they can go to DRTV, or no, was that it? DRTV what? Secrets. You mean this one? Yeah. That one, right. That's on Amazon. Yeah. They just check it out. Yeah. All the most popular stuff in there. Um, so how do you label it the, from the lab? How do you, what's, uh, what are some of the things, can people check it out? Uh, like different yeah. labels or how do you end up labeling the different products? Or? Well, it's all labeled from the lab. Oh, okay. It's all labeled from the lab Got and it. we use specific lab numbers. We never know who's going to bring it out first into retail. I mean, we just had uh, a cream that is one ingredient of the year last year in Europe mm -hmm. uh, because they had a unique mechanism for stimulating um, youth um, um, oh, collagen. It was a mechanism that had never been uh, discovered before for generating youth collagen. So the reality is we show this to our FDA attorney. The FDA attorney said she's never seen clinicals this, this good before. Mm. It basically can uh, alleviate fine lines and wrinkles as much as a collagen injection in a doctor's office. That's amazing. It's amazing. Um, um, and so we came out with the cream 
and it, we put a second active in there um, that reduces age spots and actually firms the skin up. And um, we're selling that for twenty nine ninety five. A uh, company came out with just the one active and is selling it for in retail for one fifty. Oh wow, that's amazing! Yeah, yeah. So, so how do you get people on your? What's the best way to get people actually subscribing? They can go to fromthelab.com dot mm-hmm. and check out everything we're doing. Okay. Okay. See, thank you so much. I'm five minutes past what I promised you. Any parting words? Uh, any big la- any last advice to give uh, the audience? Um, hang around with some kids. Best thing that ever happened to me is having a two year old son at this point. Um, it uh, really changes your perspective on uh, on things and keeps you young. And uh, I think it's real important to uh, to know that you know the real breakthroughs of the world don't come from recreating what you've already done but having the courage to go inside and do something in a way that might challenge you Mm -hmm. incite Mm -hmm. your curiosity and make you do things that you didn't know you were comfortable doing yeah steve Mm -hmm. it's been absolute you know pleasure i could probably you know like you said you had till sunday i would keep it going till then but uh, i appreciate it thanks so much thanks so much for talking to you 